The title this morning, The Coming Storm That Brings Silence. The Coming Storm That Brings Silence. How many of you like a storm? I like storms, you know, depending on where you're at and what you're doing. You know, if I'm out uh, in the middle of the ocean in a boat, I might not want a storm. But I like storms. I like watching storms on that, depending on what it is. But there's some storms that you wouldn't like, uh, even if you typically like storms. You know, in uh, May of 2013, there was a tornado that was, at, at least at that time, was the widest tornado um, ever recorded. It was 2.6 miles wide. You know, so that's from here into town. I mean, that's a huge tornado, and it just took everything, it just tore everything up in its path. I was out in Oklahoma. Among the 18 that died was a, a father and son team of storm chasers. And the last words recorded that they found of them were, we're going to die, we're going to die. And go ahead and turn to the next slide there. This is a picture of their vehicle um, after the the tornado was was done with it. Uh, On May 20th of this year, there was a group of teens that were celebrating, uh, graduating from high school. And so they went to Six Flags uh, over Texas. And there's a brand new ride there called the Joker. And, you know, the ride had been going. And so they got, on, but they got on the ride and it took off. And just shortly after it took off, it stopped. What had happened is, I guess there's a sensor on the ride that if there's high winds, it automatically shuts the ride down. So a big gust of wind came in and just stopped it. And they're way up 12 stories high on this ride. And it stopped it with these high winds are suddenly coming. And they were up there for a half an hour before anybody even said anything to them, like what's going on, what's happening, uh, and all of that. And well, in the, the meantime, before that, uh, as the you know they're waiting to hear what's happening, what's going on, a storm is rolling in, and it starts to rain, and then the thunder, the lightning, and the thunder comes. They ended up being up there for uh, three and a half hours, and this is in the middle of the night because I guess they left it open at night, so they. The ride took off at about midnight, and they got off at about 3.30 in the morning, just drenched from the rain. And the, the kids, many of them said this, we thought we were going to die. It was all the lightning and stuff. You know, I can't imagine being that high up and all the lightning and storms and, and stuff. They thought they were going to die. Well, here in the study of, of Revelation, we find ourselves in the midst of the tribulation, as you see on our, our chart uh, up here, we've, we've made it to this point, about right here, made it through the, the sealed judgments, or the first six there, and so the seventh one is about to be opened, and the earth is full of people who over and over have thought they were going to die, and it's already had hundreds of millions who knew they were going to die and did die. The worst time that the earth has ever known next to the flood, uh, for sure the longest period of of disaster and destruction that the world has ever known. And in the last chapter, in chapter 7, we saw the 144,000 Jews set apart, and they were had the seal of God um, put in their foreheads, and God is protecting them. We saw it like a pause. Chapter 7 was like a, a pause there where we learned some things that were going on in heaven. We learned what God was, some of the things that God was doing. Uh, and we, we saw the most amazing scene of worship uh, that we will be a part of. If we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we're going to be part of that in the latter half of, of Revelation chapter 7. Uh, but here we have point one is deafening silence. In Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, some people would say, I would never say this. This means, you've heard this before, I'm sure, that that means there's no women in heaven, right? So none of you would ever say that, but uh, I wouldn't say that. Pastor Jim would never say that. Um, It might mean there's no kids in heaven, but no, it wouldn't mean that either, would it? Uh, But silence for half an hour. You know, one of our presidents, uh, definitely not our current president, but uh, one of our presidents was known as Silent Cal. Um, and uh, that was Calvin Coolidge and president in the 1920s 
and uh, I think he was one, actually one of our one of our best presidents uh, for many many different reasons. But his his wife wanted to surprise him and had a portrait painted, and uh, she had it hung in the the library there in the White House. And so he was entered the library with a, a senator, and he saw this picture, and the first time he had seen it. So him and the senator just stood there in silence, looking at it, and finally the president said. I think so too. <laughs> you know, silence can say a lot. Silence can say a lot. Another time, President Coolidge, uh, he had a, you know, he would visit with dozens of people a day, just try to meet as many people as he could and hear them and their complaints and different things. And uh, a governor of one of the states came and saw this and said, you know, President, I don't know how you do it. You still, you know, you're done by dinner time. He said, you know, I'm usually in my office till midnight and I don't see nearly as many people uh, as you do. And the president said, yes, it's because you talk back. So he was just silent. He would just listen. Uh, and it, that's kind of what the people wanted. Just listen. But this, is, this silence is going to have such meaning to it. I mean, imagine, well, if I were just to sit here and not say anything for 30 seconds, you'd start getting antsy. Everybody would start to wiggle. You'd be moving around, like, okay, what's happening? What's going on? But 30 minutes of silence. And this isn't just, you know, you by yourself, 30 minutes of silence, which is hard to find these days, it seems like. But no, this is, remember in the last chapter, we saw multitudes of numbers that we can't even count. Numbers we can't even count, and they're all silent for the space of half an hour this is more than just a stunned silence. You know, you could have a stunned silence where you don't know what to say for a few seconds, but no, this is for a half an hour. Jesus accomplished a lot with silence when he was being questioned by Pilate, and he wouldn't answer. Silence can express a great opinion. Uh, you know, after something bad happens, Sometimes it tend to be more silent. You know, just after 9-11, uh, on 9-11, myself and Pastor Dan Rieff, we were heading down to Chicago for a print show, and we were about halfway down or so when the first tower fell, and we decided, you know what, let's not go in today. We turned around and came back. Uh, and, but the next day we went, and they had set up TVs all over just showing the coverage and stuff, and it was, a lot of people were just silent. They'd sit there and just watch and just silent, you know, and that silence said so much. You know, we were all thinking the same things. We're all on the same page. We're all in agreement, even though we were completely silent. At times, in, it could be in government meetings. It could be at ball games. After a tragedy, they might have a moment of silence. And if it lasts any more than five seconds, you know, people get a little antsy in, in that. Uh, how many of you enjoy the silence on an elevator? It's the most awkward thing, right? You get on there and it's just silent. Or maybe, you, maybe you're the type that you like to, to break that silence in the elevator and, and stuff. Uh, but I think we should spend more time being in awe of our God. A stunned silence that is prolonged, that we just sit and think about how great our God is. Now this silence here, we're is going to be seeing the judgments that are going to be on this earth. So in this silence, we could be thinking, I'm glad I'm not part of that. We could be, but most of it will be, I think, just in awe of how powerful our God is and what he is going to do. Uh, and we see in Habakkuk 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 13. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. You know, God's power is evident uh, in the silence that we're going to see here. And we need to have sometimes where we're silent. Oh, this day and age, it's hard. With You know, you have, have phones that in all the social media and all of all of these things is just keeps us busy 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 thinking about other things and keeping our mind occupied sometimes we just need to be have that silence there well god's power is going to be evident in this when we are confronted with the power and majesty of god 
we will be silent. You know, I've seen several different presidents say this, that when somebody would come in to see them, they had all the stuff they wanted to tell the president, and they got in there, and they couldn't remember anything. They said stuff totally different, and then they would usually go afterwards, go, when they were done meeting with the president, they would tell the staff, well, this is what we came for, and this is what we wanted. But just the power of the office, or the what being in that Oval Office, thinking of all the men who had been in there and all the things that had happened in there would cause them to be silent. They didn't know what to say. But that pales in comparison of this that is going to take place. The judgments up to this point uh, have been tremendous judgments. Some are, you know, like natural disasters. Others are uh, more man-made disasters, just killing each other. Uh, but the judgments that are to come are all the wrath of God without question. He'll make it very clear that it is his wrath coming on to this earth. So, so these judgments that are revealed are revealed as Christ breaks the seventh seal. As he's opening the title deed to the earth, that last seal that he is breaking will reveal these seven trumpets. Uh, and let's go ahead and look in, in point two here. Prepare for noise. So there's a preparation going on. Revelation 8 verse 2, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So at the end of this half hour of silence, there's now the seven trumpets that are given to these angels. And trumpets, they, they, in the Bible, they signify a start of something. And it could be an announcement of God's judgment. It could be the announcement of worship. Or, you know, hey, we're moving out, or to charge, or it was used at the Battle of Jericho. But trumpets signify the start of something, that something's going to happen. And we tend to think that uh, we know what things will bring about change, what will start something different. In our lives, we might think, well, if we get a new car, things are different. That's the start of something new, or a new house, or a new job, or something. We tend to think that these things, you know, make us feel like we're in control. That, you know, this is the start of something. We're in control. Um, but just this, this week in England, a man bought a brand new car, a Ferrari. The price tag is $288,000. And so he drove out of there in, you know, just this is a start of something new. And he's all excited in his new car. And within, uh, within one hour, this is what it looked like. Go ahead and Within one hour of leaving, that was his car. He got it out of there safely, but absolutely just destroyed uh, his, his car. Well, we're here witnessing the start of something that God is pronouncing. The start of a, of a bunch of judgments. Uh, this isn't a start of worship or assembly, but this is a start of judgment. We've seen in Revelation where Christ's voice is as a trumpet. But here is going to be the announcement of the judgment of God on earth, and nothing is going to be able to stop what is coming. Nothing can stop it. Psalm chapter 2, verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. You know, the silence in heaven is going to be is going to break the temporary calm on earth. You know, we saw in the last chapter, is kind of a temporary calm there. Now, that calm isn't the kind of calm we would think today because during that time of a temporary calm, you know what they're probably doing? Most of what people are doing is burying dead bodies. I mean, you think of the hundreds of millions and possibly billions that have had died already in the tribulation period. Uh, it's going to be absolute chaos and recovering, trying to recover from those things, but they won't have time to recover. It won't, won't recover, and then this next thing is going to happen, and they're going to be greater than anything the world has, has seen. But the, the trumpet, you know, something we need to think about in the trumpet, uh, the, the trumpet in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, it says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Which we just saw the report from, from Africa and Pastor Jim being over there in his book Evangelism Made Simple. 
we ought to give a certain sound. Make it as simple so that when we, the words we say, they know exactly what we mean. They know exactly what they need to do to trust Christ. Well, in this judgment, when God sounds the trumpet, there's not going to be a question of what's happening. There's not going to be a question whether this is the wrath of God or something else. God will make it very clear, very, very clear, and no one will be in doubt. Point three, the sweet smell. Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came, came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So the golden censer was to carry ashes, which we'll see uh, in a little bit here. But the prayers are placed on the altar before the throne. The prayers of the saints ascend up before God. So who are these saints? Uh, saints are not people who uh, were elevate, just elevated by man and who are people have claimed that they have performed two miracles, whether while they're alive or while people were praying to them you know after they died uh, as some would teach uh, no the saints are believers those who have trusted jesus christ as your savior so that means that would be you if you've trusted christ as your savior you're a saint you're a saint in, in god's eyes you're those that he will hear your prayers the prayers of the saints are not only just heard but they're answered he savors them he loves them. He wants to hear from them. Is he, are you giving God something to enjoy? He enjoys prayers. He enjoys when we pray. Are you giving God something to enjoy? He looks for that. He wants to enjoy that. We should be looking to bless God. We should be looking for ways to, to please Him. And it is impossible to please Him without faith. So bring your prayers to Him in faith, and He enjoys that. He takes pleasure in that. The sweet, sweet smell there. Now we saw the, the prayers of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6. And uh, those prayers will be heard. They will be answered. The judgment of God is going to come upon those who killed the martyrs. And they prayed for that. And he heard those, those prayers. And you know, this week, uh, I know the, uh, the, the youth group that's here, they've been praying for months. Uh, for this week and our the VBS and the, our family camp that we have coming up and they've been praying for months, months. God enjoys that. And this week, we keep praying and keep praying that God will do amazing things through us this, this week and that he will be pleased in all of, all of that. But he is going to show the world and he's going to show those of us who are in heaven at this time his mighty power and that he does answer prayers. And that he does, that he does not allow sin. That he will bring his wrath on those who, who turn against him, those who disobey him. Point four, the storm before the storm. We're not even to the next, the trumpet judgment yet. We're not even there yet, and there's already a, a storm. Revelation chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So already before this, this is just a warning. The fire from the altar is just a warning. We don't know how much this warning affected the earth before the judgment even gets there. But there's earthquakes and amazing, amazing a power that is shown with this. And the people on the earth will be quite frightened. And as those angels prepare to blow the trumpets, they'll know the trouble is coming. More trouble is coming. But you know what? Being warned about it, being prepared for it, won't do them a lot of good. It won't do a lot of good. Oh, they can try to be ready, but they're still trying to, trying to recover from before. You know, there's nobody on, during the tribulation that's going to be worrying about the economy and all the, the 
sale prices of homes and all of that. There won't be any of that going on. Uh, I mean, we can't imagine the turmoil that's going on. There's a, there already be famine that has taken place. Uh, hundreds of millions and possibly billions will have already died at this point. And we're not even getting into, we haven't even got into the worst judgments at this time. You know, in this day and age, we find ourselves in a time where people are arrogant enough where they think we can control the climate of our planet. And at this time, they might still think that. You know, when this starts going on, say, oh, see, if we would have, you know, listened to Al Gore, we wouldn't have all these problems that we're having uh, here today. Um, but the being ready is not going to do it. God's the one that decides how warm the planet is or how cold it is. And, uh, and of course, they've changed it to climate change, you know, because that covers everything. Well, everybody believes in climate change, right? Uh, it gets hot and it gets cold. That's change. Uh, well, they won't be able to prepare for this. What's going to happen is going to happen. They're not going to be able to stop it. They're not going to be able to prepare for it. They're not going to be able to protect themselves. Nothing that they can do will protect them from the wrath that is going to come. And that is a frightening thing. That is a, a sobering thing. But, you know, we can't... We can't... Uh, if we sin against God, you know, we're going to reap what we sow, right? God, is, God will, and nothing can change that. We're going to reap what we sow. Now, God can forgive us, and, he, and we ask for forgiveness. He promises to forgive us, but, you know, God will also, you know, God is powerful in our lives, too. Not just in the tribulation, but powerful in our lives here uh, today. Uh, but there's also no work that anybody can do to keep them the unsaved, there's no work they can do to keep them from the wrath of God. The only way to protect us from the wrath of God is to trust in the sacrifice of his son. Uh, there's a story of a, some pioneers. They were wake, uh, making their, their way through the, the central states and heading out west. And in the distance, you know, they're traveling in covered wagon and pulled by oxen, so nice and, you know, slow, steady pace. And and they see to their horror some smoke up ahead, and they and it soon grows and grows, and it's just covering the horizon. They realize realize that the the prairie is on fire, and it's coming east. It's coming at them at a rapid pace, and they know that the day before they crossed a big river, you know, and but they don't think they can make it back in time. So they're trying to figure out what are we going to do? Can we outrun this? Uh, how are we going to survive? And so what they did is they, they started a fire themselves behind them. And as the wind was blowing west, it burned an area behind them. So after it burned, they were able to get into that burned out area and just hoping that the fire would stop once it got to there because it had nothing left to burn. It had no fuel left because they had already burned this area. So as they're on the burned out area, seeing the fire approaching at a rapid speed, uh, all praying and hoping that they're going to survive. A little girl asked this question, are you sure that we shall not all be burned up? And the leader replied, my child, the flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has already been. Isn't that a great picture for us, though? When we're in Christ, and we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we're where the fire has already been. We can't be touched. We can't be touched by the wrath that is going to happen on those who have not trusted Christ as their Savior because Jesus took that wrath for us. He took that, the payment of our sins upon himself. He paid that uh, for us. You know, the book of Revelation is in ways, it's a horrible book. You know, just horrible thing after horrible thing. And we've just started as looking at our, at our chart. We've only got through the seal judgments. We're just getting in the trumpet judgments. Next week, we're going to look at a bunch of them, uh, Lord willing. And they just get worse and worse and worse. You think, well, why would we want to spend all this time in Revelation? Why would we want to look uh, at these things? Don't in this day and age, just don't we want messages that are just upbeat and positive and just exciting and how everything is great and glorious and you just need to think positively about everything? I don't think we should look at Revelation that way. You know, we have such a great God 
that here in the midst of Revelation, we're going to be in awe of his power and his majesty. We just saw that we'll be last week in Revelation 7, the worshiping of our, of our God and how wonderful that is going to be. But we have such a great God that will judge those that deserve it. And because of his love, we don't have to face that judgment. And because of his love, the rest of the world doesn't have to either if they would put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, since it hasn't started yet, since at least chapter 4 on hasn't started yet, we have a responsibility. This should give us a desire greater than just about anything else as we see this. How many of you would want your family to go through this or your neighbors to go through this? How many of you would even want your worst, na- your worst enemy to go through this? It should give us a desire to spread the gospel a desire to share the power of God with the lost, what he did, his love for them. I can't think of anything more encouraging than to think of God's love for us and that he wants to rescue us from this. And even in this judgment, many people are going to be coming to him. Many people will be coming to him, as we saw uh, last week. Uh, Someone said this, Smooth seas do not produce skillful sailors. Smooth seas do not produce skillful skillful sailors. You know, it's easy for us to look at this, look at Revelation, look at this chart and say, you know, I'm just glad I'm not going to be here. I'm just glad I don't have to go through that rough time. But you know, us today as Christians will go through hard times. We're going to go through difficult, difficult times, but that's because God wants to be able to use us for something better than what we're doing right now. He wants to prepare us for the next thing in our life. Prepare us to do something a little bit more. And then he's going to test us again. He's going to continually put us through the storms of life to make us a little bit better. You, know, you think of the, the refining process of, of maple syrup. You know, they, they tap a hole into the tree and they put a, a tap there and put a bucket under it and drain. It's basically like water. Uh, that comes out of the, the maple tree. And uh, in a good day, 50 trees can yield between 30 and 40 gallons uh, of maple syrup. And, but what you have is basically water, and it just has a hint of sweetness. You barely even know it's there. But then what they do is they take it, and they put it in these huge pots, and they bring it to a very slow boil. And they do this for a long time, and then they, they strain it and boil it again. And at the end of this, they boil away most of the water. So in the end, those 30 to 40 gallons of original sap, the syrup that came out of the the tree, produces one gallon of maple syrup. And this is real maple syrup, not the fake stuff, the colored water that, you know, who knows what's in it, you know, you find in most stores, but the real good maple syrup uh, there. But it goes through a process has to be boiled and boiled and boiled. And when we trust Christ, we're pretty worthless. And if you were to just take maple syrup that hasn't been boiled and just put it on something, you wouldn't even know. It would, kind of, it would wreck your pancakes. But through that process, you know, now all of a sudden it's something you know, most people enjoy there. Well, when we trust Christ as our Savior, we're pretty worthless. We are very worthless. But then God starts to work in us. That same power that we're going to be in awe of when he opens that seventh seal and reveals what's to come. The same awe that we're shown there, we should be in awe of that same power that is used to form you and me, try to fashion us into the likeness of God's dear Son, Jesus Christ. He wants to conform us to the image of his Son. We're not conformed to the image of this world, but it takes God's skill. It takes his power. And with 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, ye shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So let's not just sit here and look at these horrible judgments that are coming with a smug expression and say, you know what? I'm pretty hot stuff. I'm just glad I don't have to be a part of them. I don't have to be like those schmucks that have to go through that tribulation. Instead, let us be vessels that are useful. Let us stand in the 
in awe of the power of God and let him use us to take as many people with us when the rapture comes. So we can tell as many people about the gospel as as possible so when the rapture comes, there are less people here on this earth to go through that horrible, horrible tribulation. Of course, if you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die, you need to understand that. You need to know if the rapture were to happen today, would you be among those taken to heaven or would you be left behind? The only ones that will be taken to heaven during the rapture will be those who have put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, those who know that they're going to heaven. So how can we know for sure that we're going to heaven when we, when we die? Well, let this hand represent all of us, and I'll let my wallet represent sin. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We fall far short of the glory of God. And we just saw a picture of some of God's glory here to, today. We fall far short of that. In order to go to heaven, we'd have to be absolutely perfect. But all of us are born in sin, and we have sinned. The only payment of that sin is death. So if we die with any sin on us, it's unpaid for, we'll die and spend an eternity in hell forever. But God loved us so much, He doesn't want us to die and spend an eternity in hell forever. So He sent His Son to pay that penalty for us. Let this hand represent Jesus, and in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, we can't work our way to heaven. We can't come, go to church enough or get baptized enough to pay for our sin. The only payment of sin is death, and that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and the third day rose again. So how do we get that free gift? By simply putting our trust and faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, we can know for sure that we're going to heaven if we do that. Thank you for watching our message today. I pray that it was a blessing to you. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry, please go to our website at calvaryflorida.com. And don't forget to tell us if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you'd like to hear more of our messages, make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Until next time, God bless.